You've got to be able to speak the business language and make a difference in how the business is being run. And then the second part of that to me is never stop pushing to be part of the discussion and the conversation. I mean, oftentimes, it, and especially in the roles that I've played, it, you want to experience how things are unfolding. You want to see how decisions are being made. You want to see how people interact mm. and think so that you can help them and we can help each other be as good as our potential would suggest we can be. Welcome to the CEO Sessions, hosted by Ben Fanning. And here's Ben. I've got a great show in store for you today with an interview with Mr. Bob Ravner, who's an accomplished and widely recognized business leader, author, and speaker. He served in executive roles with several organizations, including the Fortune 200 companies of PepsiCo, the Home Depot, Starbucks, and most recently Dollar General, where he retired after serving as the chief people officer from 2008 to 2019. And they had quite a run while he was there. During that time, they doubled in size to a $26 billion company with more than 140,000 employees. He also has a background as a U.S. Navy submarine officer. And uh, he finished his active duty service in the U.S. Naval Academy, where he served as the athletic in the athletic department as the academic liaison officer, as an instructor, coach, and recruiter. He also spent time in the Naval Reserves there following active duty. He's a graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy also, and he earned the distinction as a leader, intercollegiate varsity baseball player, and is past president of his class there. And he's got an MBA from NYU, that's right, New York University. And he currently is on a whole host of boards uh, that informs his leadership experience, including Goodwill Industries, uh, the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta Human Capital Advisory Council. He also has an interesting uh, background where he serves on the board of Franklin Civil War Historical Commission, Friends of Franklin Parks Board, the Tennessee Congressional Service Academy of Selection Boards. He's also served as the past chair of the Tennessee Workforce Development Board and chair of the Human Resources Leaders Council for Retail Industries. Uh, I mean, the, it's a huge, long list, including the President's National Hire, the National Hire Veterans Committee and the Secretary of Labor's Advisory Committee for Veterans Employment Training and employer outreach. Wow. Tons and tons of credentials. Now, let me tell you a little bit, a couple of highlights to this interview that I think you're really going to get a lot out of today. In this order, you're going to learn how to write your book, even when you're in the busy C-suite life. And you can tell from Bob's background, yes, he wrote a book while he was engaged in all this. And he shares some of those those uh, strategies and secrets with you on in this podcast interview. We also get into the most important advice for any employee who wants to be in the room where it happens. That's right. If you want to be in the corner office meeting with the CEO and where, where those decisions are made, it gives some very important advice in terms of how to get there and how to stay there. Then we get into the critical attribute that Home Depot CEO Bob Nardelli and Dollar General CEO Richard Dryling had as had as mentors. So they were mentors of Bob's and they disclose a, a common, uh, or he discloses a common attribute that they both had that, that you're really going to hear. Then Bob talks about what he learned about handling failure from his interactions with Starbucks CEO, Howard Schultz. And then we get into the simple playbook for finding a great mentor. He unloads a lot of helpful information around the critical role mentors played in his life and career and what to do if you don't really have those kinds of great mentors in your your career right now, what you can go do about that. Then we talk about the common trait that he'd instill in every employee. And believe me, this one single trait will indeed surprise you as it did me. And the, we'll get into the three key communication strategies to present your idea to the C-suite. So you've got a big idea for the C-suite, or if you're in the C-suite and you're trying to make your idea resonate more, Bob has got some great ideas and strategies. I thoroughly enjoyed doing this interview, and I think you'll tell. Enjoy. Hi, Bob. Welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Ben. My pleasure. 
So for our listeners, I just want to tee this episode up a little bit with Bob here. I actually presented to the Dollar General Young Professionals a few years ago, and uh, I was blown away with their staff and their energy and the culture that they had created. And he and I didn't actually connect then, but we ended up having coffee a couple times when he was coming through Charleston. And I left almost every one of those conversations, Bob, wishing that I had recorded our conversation <laughs> because there was so much great business insight, but also we hit a lot of stuff around history. Um, and I thought it was really interesting. And I thought uh, maybe you can share a little bit about some of the work you're doing in that before we get into you know, the strategies and, and up your, your other book. Maybe talk a little bit about your interest in that. Well, Ben, and thank you for saying that. And uh, as you know, and as we've talked, uh, I certainly got a lot out of our conversations as well. So, so thanks for taking that yeah. time. Yep. If you're thinking about uh, my interest in history, obviously with my, uh, my own military history and background, and I have a long family history in the military mm -hmm. and service to the nation, I um, actually uh, thought my next project was uh, for years I've been trying to think about how to tell my grandfather's story, who led an amazing life, uh, 43 years in uniform, both active duty, state militia reserves, and as well as a career in the New York Police Department. During times where the country was going through so much change in the first half of the 20th century, and uh, him being part of all of that, uh, was trying to find a way that I could get that down on paper so it wasn't just in my research notes and, and things I've been able to discover. And so that's my, my latest passion is working on that, which also feeds my interest mm. in learning more about early 20th century history in America as well. Yeah, wow. Yeah, it's amazing, you know, taking the time to research that and get that going takes a lot of energy and focus. And you know, one of the things that really blew me away too, whenever we first met and connected was the fact that you'd written a book uh, while you're um, CHRO for Dollar General. Um, and I think a lot of listeners out there are maybe considering the idea of writing a book themselves. You know, that maybe they're thinking they want to do that after they retire. But man, in the midst of a really high profile career. Uh, what, are, what are some of the things that, that you were thinking about when you were considering writing it? And then what are some strategies you used to actually get that thing done? Well, the first thing I'd say is, uh, I think just putting things down on paper and in these days down on computer, and whether that's through journals or diaries or just regular note-taking, I think capturing experiences is always beneficial because you can often go back and, and reflect on, on those things that you took at the time they were happening. In my case with the book, I, I didn't end up writing a book while I was in the C-suite uh, of Dollar General. That's where it all culminated, but mm -hmm. it really was a 15 to 20 year process of capturing stories and experiences uh, along the way. And, and really my goal initially was I just wanted to be able to document uh, experiences from my life that ultimately my, my kids might find some interest in over time. Uh, mm -hmm. If you read my book and go, go back and look at my background, uh, my family lost everything when I was at was young, including photos and, and any, any real family history. And so I wanted to begin to document that and research it along the way so that I could both uh, capture it as it was happening, as well as go back and try to recreate things that had happened that got lost uh, over those years. And so mm. what that ended up becoming were a series of stories that when you started to piece it all together, started to create some some kind of cohesive message that ultimately culminated in probably three years of concentrated effort of compiling it, organizing it, editing it, and finally getting it out. So, and, 
and we'll dive into the contents of Up, your book, in just a minute. I'm really curious, were there, so there's a lot of, a lot of great stories in there. You obviously spent a lot of time getting those, and you say you did it along and along. Did, did you have any specific routines or rituals so you'd remember to go back and do that, or did you do it on flights between point A to point B, or what, what was your practice in getting all that written down? Well, the first, first parts of it were during a lot of uh, flights. Uh, for most of my career, I was on the road a lot of the time. And between evenings in hotel rooms, flights from point A to point B, and finding ways to cap- capture stories, uh, as well as having the experiences that were provided to me through uh, the different jobs and, and career that I had over the years. And so you kind of put that all together and captured it in a way that uh, was something that it, at the very least someone else could take a look at and say, Oh, that's, that's what happened. Because, you know, one of the motivations for me was, and it maybe it's born on my thirst for history, but think of it, how many of us would have loved to have asked more questions of our parents, grandparents, even great grandparents mm. and the past and the experiences they've had, and just never did. For whatever reason, I'm just like most people, didn't ask enough questions, didn't have enough information when they were still alive. And now I regret not having to, not asking them and then having to go back and try to recreate history through public documents. Wow. Yeah, I love that. And also that thematically, that connects to what you're doing right now with the history book that you're putting together about your grandfather's story, is you're piecing mm-hmm. that together. Um, well, exactly. And uh, one of the things I've found through the, the research, when, especially when you go back in history before the advent of first radio and then TV and now the Internet, the newspapers were by and large the way the world communicated. And it's amazing to read stories from the 1800s and the early 1900s and how descriptive they are. Because if you think about it, the, the authors, the, the writers of those stories basically had to help the readers get placed in the information and experiences that they were writing about. So they were very, very descriptive. And it's, and it's really a colorful way to, to write and to go back and research history. It's almost as if they're trying to help you be there. And now you're looking at something 100 years earlier. Wow. Well. Kudos on Getting Up Done, and it's a fine book. I definitely recommend it. Um, and it's, I, I'm really glad that we got a little bit of behind the scenes on how that got done and those strategies. I think a lot of the listeners, when they're thinking about it, this is something that they could consider. Were there any, uh, before we move on, is there, is there, what, were, was there any specific tool you used in writing or framework or book uh, that you used uh, in the writing process that comes to mind? Well, I think one thing you realize by going through that process is that there's a complete subculture uh, of writing and, and <laughs> editing and publishing yeah. Oh, yeah. that uh, I had no idea uh, about. And I, I would say the editing process was probably the most helpful because when you, when you write things down, they're all important to you. And, and as I was writing them, I was thinking that these would all be relatable, but then you put them in front of a, a disinterested editor who doesn't necessarily know you from Adam and yeah. doesn't even know what you do. And they all of a sudden tell you that this seems to be more interesting than that. You may want to say more about this and take some of that out. And so that was very helpful. Yeah. Editors can be a little bit brutal and they, that's what they get paid to do though. <laughs> um, exactly. Well, let's, so let's move into this. I, I love this quote that I'm going to, I'm going to read from the book uh, is actually from Rick Dryling, who's the former chairman and CEO of Dollar General. Um, and I mean, talking about high praise here, watching Bob's approach to his career, his family and commitments and his always positive attitude has taught me more than all the classroom and self-help books I have encountered. And I mean, this book starts out where you're in the boardroom, right? Right before the release of the IPO. Is that correct? 
Am I, am I recounting that? That's correct. It, it starts with us filing the paperwork. Filing the paperwork. Okay. And so th this caught my eye for, my, uh, for, for many reasons. Number one, you obviously had, through the credibility, through your, your career, um, you had a big impact on the CEO. Okay. You know, your, your boss equivalent there. And this company's filing their IPO and the, the chief human resource officer is in the room where it happens to quote uh, Hamilton, right? You're in the room where it happens. And there are a lot of people that never get in that room, right? Where it happens. Um, what advice do you have for employees who want to be in the room where it happens? Well, I'd say a few things. One, uh, Rick Dryling was an amazing CEO who's since retired from Dollar General, uh, still staying active uh, on boards. Uh, I have, as you know, since retired from Dollar General. So speaking for myself and not on behalf of Dollar General. Um, and I, I would tell you that the lessons of getting a seat at the table have everything to do with a combination of having the the, the, do, the knowledge, the business acumen to deserve a seat at the table, meaning that you can help the organization make its business better. Uh, we all have our specific roles to play. My, mm -hmm. I, I have always thought of myself first as a, a business person professional who happens to have an expertise in human resources, not a human resources professional. So uh, I, I really prided myself on being mm -hmm. a business person and that, and what that means is, so mm. make your case, state what you believe, but then once your opinion has been made, then also understand where the decision making ends up being, and then end up getting behind that scenario. I would often say to a leader that I I would work around is, look, I'm going to you pay me for my opinion. So I'm going to give you my opinion. And then you ultimately may be the one that has to make the decision, but you're going to make that decision with all of the information at your disposal and with the best information and counsel and guidance I can provide. And then in my, my role is, mm -hmm. Hey, once I've stated my opinion, once I've made my case for a direction in whatever form that takes, but then I need to get behind the ultimate decision and the outcome of where that decision the decision takes us along the way. And I think where I see people often get bogged down is they won't let go of a particular perspective and then they kind of hold, hold a grudge uh, because the direction taken was not the one that they supported. And there's just too much going on and there's too much at stake to, to get bogged down in, in the, that, that kind of detail and not let go of it. Hmm. A lot of wisdom in that. Well, wow. okay. So let's, let's take a step back. Uh, I want to maybe hit this part of your book where you talk a lot about your childhood and it was not, you did not have an easy time as a child. Uh, maybe tell us a little bit about what it was like growing up. And then, I mean, talk about, you know, did you ever think you'd ever be in a C-suite? Well, let me answer that part first. Um, growing up, I didn't even know there was a C-suite. Uh, <laughs> okay. yeah. I had no idea there was a C-suite. Uh, my, mm -hmm. my, my family, my history had no background in corporate America, so I had no idea uh, what that was going to be. Now, once I got into corporate America, uh, I absorbed as much as I could to really understand where I wanted to ultimately go within my career, which ultimately wanted to take us take me to the, to, to the C-suite. Uh, but if you think about my background, uh, very dysfunctional family, uh, two alcoholic parents. Uh, when, when you think about what my siblings and I had to go through, lost uh, all of our possessions, moved nine times by the time I was 18, uh, you know, constantly in a a very uh, abusive kind of environment that so wasn't healthy at all. Mm. Now, the, the good news for me is I was uh, uh, had the experience of being around 
many people that saw potential in me and took me under their wing so that uh, they would help me continue to advance and, and do the kinds of things and take the kinds of steps that would help me keep moving in the right direction. And you know, I think that's a message that everybody can take away is um, if it weren't for my coaches, teachers, uh, other people who really gave me their time and, and their expertise, uh, there's no way I would have been able to, uh, get to get to the places I was able to because they took a personal interest in me. And I think the more we all take personal interest in others, the more we're going to help them uh, can continue to succeed. I, I get no more satisfaction than helping other people achieve their own career goals and aspirations and, and get to the places that they want to get. And I think when the people that helped me along the way had that same kind of mindset. And so, uh, yeah, it was a difficult period growing up. I mean, it, it, it was definitely a, a challenge. But I, w I would say the, the one thing that kind of kept me moving uh, in the right direction was not becoming a victim of those circumstances or a victim of that environment and uh, kept learning, growing and continuing to push myself forward. Setbacks along the way, sure, but we all have those. But uh, between perseverance and an attitude, um, was able to overcome a lot of those obstacles and kind of keep moving it forward. And so it might be two steps forward, one step back, but at the end of the day, it kept kept advancing toward uh, being the better me over time. In your book and, and, and how you just mentioned that about the people that aided you along the way. And uh, there were a couple of stories in there. Um, when, when I read the names, I was like, wow, those are some, <laughs> I mean, some are pretty big names like uh, Nardelli. And of course you mentioned Dryling. Are there any specific stories or ways that, mentors like that made you feel taken care of or like they were aiding you in a certain way that you eventually maybe were even able to help others with? Well, well the, the best leaders I've ever come across and, and the, and, and the, and the people you've mentioned mm -hmm. at those senior levels, the, the one thing I think that stands them apart from others is they make you feel like you're the most important person in the world when they're talking mm. to you. So, and I could tell you from people who are very senior when I was the most junior to even in situations where uh, they, there was really nothing that I was going to be able to do to help them, but they still took a personal positive interest and engaged me. And I think, you know, that's, that's a critical attribute wow. uh, of people to be successful is if you think in terms of, and, and the phrase I like to use is, if you're interested in others, instead of being interesting, other people are going to respond to that. And I would say the ones who influenced me the most are the ones who were interested in me and didn't see me as an audience for them to be interesting. And I think that's a very subtle yet critical distinction between people who are just out for their own gain and will use others along the way to achieve that gain versus others who are really trying to get the best out of you, which ultimately ends up helping them along the way, but that's not their main goal. Yeah. Wow. And so, so what if, you know, probably some of the listeners are out there saying, man, we, you know, I don't have these kinds of mentors in my life right now. Uh, I'd like to have some. Uh, I certainly being, I love that uh, being interested in others instead of being interesting might be a way uh, to go about identifying those mentors. Any other strategies or advice you give to people who don't feel like they have those kinds of positive mentors but, but would like them? I think the best way to get mentored is to go out and ask for it. I think uh, the, the common mistake people make when they have a mentor is they want the mentor to basically dump all their knowledge and experiences on them and they're going to be better for it. When in reality, what those being mentored ought to be doing is driving the mentoring relationship. If, if you think about what 
a mentor is, it's going to be somebody that has already got a lot going on in their own world. And out of the kindness of their hearts or, or, and or genuine, genuine interest in saying, I'm going to help this particular individual um, move forward because I see something in that person. But that mentor isn't the one that should be driving the relationship. It should be the one being mentored. And so I would say be uh, assertive about asking for mm-hmm. someone that you might be interested in being a mentor for you and asking if they're willing to do it. And to the extent that they are, and, and you can convince them that it's time well spent by them, then take that ownership and accountability to make the most out of that mentoring relationship without being a pest along the way, if you will, but working out a mutually agreeable interaction that is going to benefit you from that mentor and not waste their time along the way. I think the most frustrating parts of mentoring is if someone doesn't do anything with that relationship. Mm. Yeah. One of the things that I remember coming out of some mentoring or someone told me once is if someone's taking the time to mentor you and they give you some advice, if you go and you do something with it, make sure you report back <laughs> and, and show them. Um, and for the list, that, that's exactly right. I, I, I think there's nothing worse than you asking for advice repeatedly and then never using that advice. Sooner or later, people say, why am I giving you advice? <laughs> Cause you never <laughs> use it. And so, <laughs> I think it's an important, and by the way, that may be the wrong mentoring relationship along the way, but at the same time, if you're going to ask for people's opinions, at some point, you want to be listening to what they have to say because they're telling you for a reason and they've also got experiences that probably make that advice worthwhile under the right circumstances. Hmm. Yeah, I like that a lot. And for the listeners... I mean, Bob just pretty much gave you a play-by-play on how to find great mentors, not just not just at work, but in life. <laughs> so uh, you might want to listen to that bit again to make sure you've got it down. So that, I thought that was really a nice tight <laughs> synopsis on how to go about doing it. Um, one of the things that I think you've got some examples for that really came to me reading the book is and let you kind of run with it here. When's the time you had an unexpected twist or failure in your career? Um, It just, it just seems like you've got a knack for turning these into growth and success situations down the road. So uh, do you mind sharing a couple of those with us? Sure. Probably the the most pivotal one that that comes to mind is uh, when I was running HR for the U S for Starbucks and we were going through some some real challenging times right on the front end of the, the Great Recession. Uh, Howard Schultz, who had been the chairman of the board for uh, quite a while, uh, stepped back in to become the CEO again. And uh, meanwhile, the current chief human resource officer had been, had been retiring, and I was one of the candidates to be his replacement. Well, as Howard was stepping in, in, into the chair, much like any new head coach coming in, coaching a new football team, want to surround themselves with people who they, they know and have confidence in. Well, I, I knew Howard from being at the company, uh, but because he wasn't in an operating role, and at the time I was not sitting in board meetings, um, he knew me from afar, I knew him from afar, and he had someone else in mind that he knew better, and, and I couldn't blame him for doing that. So he called me into his office and said, you know, hey, there are lots of great things about you. I want you to continue to do a great job here. You can do anything you want to in the company, um, but I'm going to go with this other person to step in to be to run HR for Global Starbucks, which couldn't couldn't argue with that line of thinking. Uh, still thought I was the the best guy to do the job, and so that was a setback. But at the same time, uh, I didn't wallow in that disappointment. Uh, I went right to work in terms of helping the new person step in and take, take on the role who, who was an internal guy. So I had already had a relationship with him uh, and try to be a constructive, productive, supportive member of that team. But at the same time, I also knew that, Hey, at, at some point uh, I, I definitely want to run uh, an HR organization and six months into it or thereabouts, I got the call for this company called dollar general. And 
you know, and I look back on it, I then spent 11 years, almost 11 years as the chief HR officer for Dollar General. And had that setback not happened at the time it did with Starbucks, in all likelihood, I would not have become the chief HR officer at Dollar General and wouldn't have had the opportunity and the pleasure to help that company really reinvent itself and, and become uh, a major player in the discount retail space. And so my, my lesson from all of that was, look, setbacks are going to happen in life. They happen all the time. So whether it's, you're, you know, you don't get to play on the A team for a time, you get benched in a sporting event. You, there are lots of disappointments that happen in life, but it's how you respond to them that really make the difference. And I think uh, one of the things that I like to say is that I, I can't control 100% of what happens to me, mm-hmm. but I do control 100% of how I respond to, ha- mm-hmm. to what happens to me. And I think that was the difference for me in keeping my head on straight, really helping the organization continue to move forward. And then lo and behold, this opportunity came, uh, came to me. And uh, I think um, I'm, I couldn't be more thankful for that opportunity I've come along. Yeah, it's really, it, it sounds a lot like, you know, everyone has failures and things that don't turn out as they, as they had planned them to. But the real magic, I think, in what you're saying is, is by saying my response is 100% in my control, you really can choose to process it in a way that's beneficial. And it sounds like you left, um, even though you left Starbucks, you know, and, and you went on the Dollar General, it sounds like, and I've noticed this throughout, throughout the book, you, know, you built great relationships. Uh, you leave the place better than when you found it kind of thing, right? You make improvements. And, uh, you know, the alternative is not processing it in a positive way and being disgruntled. And I think a lot of people fall into that. Um, are, are there any, is there anything else you'd recommend to someone that's facing a failure or something in an organization and, and they're not sure how to, how to go about doing it or even if they even want to stay at the organization? Well, I, I think the, the most pure advice is communication is always a key. I, I can't tell you mm. how many times I've talked with people that I've given coaching and counseling to who were thinking in one direction and, and thinking through one thing when I suggest that they have a conversation that they're reluctant to have only to find out after they have a conversation, it's like, yeah, that wasn't bad at all. Or yeah, that got resolved pretty quickly. And I, so I think there is no substitute at all for communication and get it on the table so that you can work your way through it and understand it. Cause I think that helps reduce anxiety along mm-hmm. the way. And you're not, you're not um, imagining what someone's thinking or what an outcome is going to be. You're actually finding out and then, and then always do something with that information. So, so if you screw up, you know, just, you apologize for screwing up and, and, and you come back with, and here's what I'm going to do so that I don't screw that up again. Um, take accountability and ownership for the mistake. Don't try to excuse it away. Don't try to blame it on someone else. Just say, this is what happened. Um, it's on me. Here's how I'm going to go mm-hmm. through it. And then also continue to, to work with the, those individuals, whether it's on the team or your immediate manager or, or people that report directly to you is talk through so that there are clear expectations with everybody about how things are going and what needs to be done differently. And I, I have found without exception that when there is good communication in place, there's less drama. And when there's little communication in place, there's more drama. <laughs> oh, and, and that's I think, probably and a I good think quote right tips, there. <laughs> Yeah. And I, and I think one of the tips for people is don't get caught up in drama. And to the mm-hmm. extent that you have a, you have a setback, talk to somebody about it. Think about what caused that setback, what you'll do differently to avoid that setback in the future and keep pushing yourself forward so that you're on to the next thing. Uh, and, and by the way, part of that may include, you may be having a bad day, but uh, when's the last time somebody went out and helped uh, an organization in a nonprofit way and, and felt bad after that. 
Yeah. You know, so whether it's Habitat for Humanity or the local uh, soup kitchen or uh, putting food in backpacks for school kids. I mean, those are all things that just take your time. But I have never talked to anybody that's ever done that kind of work that have felt bad after doing it. Yeah, that's a great way to turn it around. Yeah, to, and, and be, I like the idea of being physically active in that, physically present and doing something else to turn it around. Now, you mentioned the word drama. And I bet in your time as CHRO and leading in multiple organizations, you probably had a few times where someone quit or was fired and there was a lot of drama without, and, and you don't, I, if you want to skip this one, that's okay. But, but without naming any names, what was a colorful situation that happened when someone was going to quit or be fired <laughs> that, that occurred? Well, I, I think uh, there are, to your point, there are many situations where, where that, that kind of thing has unfolded and, and invariably the advice is to people that let, like, let's take a step back and let's think about the root causes of this. What, it, what is driving this emotion at this point? And how can you mitigate that emotion by doing something else that might be constructive or tangible that will move you away from, from the, this drama? And part of that, and look, you don't, you don't save all those situations. I, I can remember one person that quit on my team earlier in my career because they felt like they just couldn't do it anymore. Uh, it just there weren't enough hours in the day and uh, they had too many competing priorities. Uh, and, and look, everybody faces challenges in balancing their, their work life and their home life and all the other things that they may be doing. But as I was talking to the individual about it, began to recognize that much more of that anxiety was because of what the individual was placing on himself mm. than what, what anyone else was placing on them. Wasn't communicating really well, didn't, didn't look to partner in things that others could do versus what, what he could do. And I think it's a common challenge, especially you know, if you think about service-minded people they want to do good things for other people. And so there is a tendency to often take on more because that's what your, your, that's your makeup. You want to, mm -hmm. you want to do things for other people. Yet if you never say no, or just say, I've got too many other things, you can become overburdened and then ultimately burn yourself out along the way. And so I think it's a combination of those things where let's find out what's really causing the issue in front of us here. Let's talk mm -hmm. through that. Let's, Let's think of a way to, to kind of manage around it. And sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. But tell you in the situations where they don't work most often is when there is a lack of communication. Mm -hmm. So if people are holding back and they'll just keep absorbing more until they break, but never say anything until they break, uh, those are harder to recover than those areas where you have more open and more regular dialogue and communication about how things are going and I think that's a big leadership point about being present with the team that you're leading because not everybody is going to be openly communicative about what's going on in their world. So they may be intimidated. They may not want to burden anybody, whatever their reasons. Uh, it's up to the leader to, to really be close enough to the folks that they're leading to kind of understand that somebody's a little off their game and to probe that and try to find it out before it gets to the breaking point. Mm-hmm. Wow. So that's a great segue into this. So obviously communication is key for every employee uh, and it, every leader, every employee in the organization uh, to learn that skill. And we talked about earlier and you mentioned learning to speak the language of the C-suite. When an employee has an idea, an organization, so let's take Dollar General, right? There are thousands of employees in Dollar General someone has an idea of something that they would like to be part of or a change they would like to initiate. What's your advice on how they should communicate that to the C-suite? Well, I think it's always important to communicate most directly with the people closest to you. And so 
if the motive is that I ultimately want to help the organization, then it really shouldn't matter who gets the credit for it or, and it shouldn't be a driving force that you want to make sure somebody at the top knows that it's your idea. Now, that being said, human nature being what it is, I do think <laughs> it's important for individuals to communicate with their, their managers and, and, and make a point of view because what I've found more times than not is as those ideas and opinions are communicated, people find improvements they can make in it. They can ask probing questions. And so hmm. it, 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 it gets baked in a better way. And I think better set up for success at the next level by working through the channels. I, I spent a lot of my time, when I was working with other people who wanted to present an idea to the CEO for, for that matter. And even within my own department, you know, if we had to do something that we needed to communicate to the senior team, uh, we'd go through walkthroughs with me and, and others as well to say, well, they're going to want to know about this. And, uh, Hey, that's, this has been a big, part of the conversation lately or this information is missing. So there are a lot of details that would help frame the discussion and make it an ultimately better idea to, to give it a better chance of success once you get to the C-suite. And I think everybody wins mm -hmm. in that situation. The idea, the idea gets adopted. Everybody high fives because uh, you got it through and everybody, everybody shares in the, in the credit along the way. And Look, if you're a good leader, you're going to recognize the person that came up with the idea and recognize them in the right way. And whether that is you nudge the CEO and say, you know, hey, I want you to know this was so-and-so's idea, uh, even while the presentation's underway, uh, where, mm -hmm. where drama gets increased and where challenges arise is when somebody wants to take credit for someone else's idea. And, and what you really ought to be thinking about it doesn't really matter who gets the credit. It, it ought to be what's going to be better for the organization. So learning to work within the channel. Uh, I, I hear you, I heard you say that, and I think that's definitely a skill that can be developed. And when you're in a big organization and you have a military background, so you've, you've worked within a lot of different kinds of organizations, <laughs> um, you know, that's a skill in and of itself. So to get to the C-suite, has that been – uh, something that you've really uh, that you really had to hone in early on. You know, I think uh, my advice to to people who want to do a good job is to focus on the job they have. And uh, as mm -hmm. my old college baseball coach used to say, the cream always rises to the top. Hmm. And mm -hmm. if if people do the best job in the job they're in and don't worry about what comes next and uh, Am I doing the right things to get to the next level? Those things tend to work themselves out. And I, I think if people's motives are pure in that, whatever they're doing, they show up every day trying to make the organization a better place and not how quickly they can get ahead. They're the ones that, that tend to not only become the most successful, they also get advanced the quickest because people see what their, their motivation is and they're, and they, gain so much knowledge and value to the organization. It's hard not to pull them forward. I like that. Do a great job with the job you have. And that's the thing at your foot at, at your very feet anyway, instead of worrying about the job you want, what about, about the job you have right now? <laughs> and do a great job at that. Yeah. Um, and, and I think a, an easier way to say that, which is something everybody's heard is focus on what you control. Yeah. So, you know, I don't control, whether or not I'm going to be in the C-suite, I do control the job in front of me. I need to make sure that I'm clear on the goals and objectives of that job. I need to make sure that I'm communicating clear expectations with my manager so that we're on the same page and I'm working on the things that I can control. What's the one trait that you wish you could instill in every employee? Well, I would say for me, if I go back in my career and think about uh, what I would do differently, to me it was it would be patience. Whoa. Okay. Tell you know, I'm a, I'm a I'm 
I'm a driver kind of a guy. I'm action oriented. Uh, and there are a lot of positive things that come from those kinds of attributes. Uh, on the other hand, patience is not one of them. <laughs> and so I certainly, I certainly learned over the years um, to be more patient with uh, things that might or might not get adopted, uh, a direction that the organization might take. Sometimes things are ahead of their time. Sometimes time has already passed them by. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, and I, and I would also say, uh, you know, I wasn't always heeding my own advice about just, I, I wanted to move as far and as fast as I possibly could and wasn't as patient as I should have been along the way to say, look, I'm just, this, this is going to work itself out and I'm going to continue to do the best job I know how to and focus on what I can control. And by the way, not lose any sleep over it. Uh, earlier in my career, I was a lot more impatient about those kinds of things. And um, I think patience over time has served me well and served others well as I've watched other people exhibit those same kind of traits. Well, yeah, I wouldn't expect pa patience surprise me, especially from someone <laughs> from the C-suite. However, hearing you talk about it, it makes total sense. Um, and again, going back to focusing on what you can control. Yeah, man, I, I, like, I like that. Uh, but Bob, I, I know you're, I know you've got limited time here, but I've got just a couple more quick questions here. Um, what books and newsletters or magazines or even websites, uh, do you recommend for someone who's on a mission to get to the C-suite one day? Well, I, and I might reframe what their mission is, because I, what I would say is what people ought to be focused on is how do I become the best person and the best professional I possibly can to the extent an outcome of that is the C-suite, uh, so be it. But I think if, mm -hmm. if people are focusing on how do, I, how do I continue to learn, grow, and develop, I, I would say the, the key element of that is becoming and being a continuous learner. And mm. without any particular books, while I would say my favorite still is a, is a Maxwell book called Developing the Leader Within You. Okay, uh, yep. and, and all of the Maxwell stuff is, is very good when it comes, comes to leadership. But I've been a proponent of just absorbing as much as I possibly can, specifically within uh, trade publications, you know, being current in what's going on within the world, the business community, because part of it is being part of the conversation. You know, I, it took me a while to realize, but especially sitting in the C-suite and then sitting in board meetings, we'd get probed with a lot of questions. And that's what board members do. They ask a lot of questions. That's what they're supposed to do. Uh, they're trying to, to really understand what's going on. Until I realized that at one point in time when I became a real a daily reader of the Wall Street Journal is that a lot of the questions they were asking were coming from the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> <laughs> and so, <Really> <laughs> so and, and and by the way, that that's not anything but people are people that are in those kinds of roles are voracious readers. They absorb information, they understand what's going on because they're reading about it. You know, and to the extent, it, whether it's the Wall Street Journal or uh, Harvard Business Review, trade publications and the retail industry, there are several of those. But the other thing I would say, uh, one of the things I, I, I discovered, and it doesn't cost anything, there's a free app called Overdrive that works through your public library. And for almost 10 years of my commute back and forth to work, um, it, it, in the last 10 years, uh, but over the course of my career, I used to, in the old days, would listen to books on tape. Mm -hmm. And today, I just I just use the app Overdrive and connect through the public library. And every day, back and forth on my commute, I, I was doing about a book every two weeks or 25 books a year just during my commute. And wow. and I don't think they have to be in any one subject. You know, my, my interests happen to be a lot in history, military, business, biographies, and every one of us can learn something from everything we read and absorb. And so it doesn't matter to me as much what it is that you're absorbing. It's 
understanding what you're absorbing and, and, and finding out if there's an application of it to the, the work that you have to do. And so just by, think about that, just during the course of a yearly commute, I was reading 25 books through, through the head, through my headset, um, five days a week. And you know, it was kind of almost no investment uh, of anything beyond that. Well, my next question was going to be about tools or gadgets that contribute to your success. And I think overdrive <laughs> would qualify. It sounds like any other ones. Yeah. I mean, there's audible.com, uh, yeah. you know, the, the publications like uh, look, Harvard business review is always writing good stuff. Uh, the wall street journal, I think is a fantastic uh, investment. And a- as well as, uh, you know, I would say I would, it's not too far of a reach to find out what the people that you're working with are, are reading as well, because other people have other, other ideas and, and other things that, that they're absorbing that may also help you in the work that you're trying to do. That's great. Hmm. Any other, you, you mentioned the John Maxwell book. I've read several of his books, but not that specific one. That's one to check out. Are there any other books by any other authors or specific biographies that really leapt out at you as, Hey, this is something that, uh, I, I need to share with some other people. I, I would say, I mean, no, no one, I, I, I was not a huge constant business book reader. I read a lot of biographies and I would say any of the biographies by some of the great authors are, uh, and, and for me, it, it, if you combine my love and knowledge of history to people that write historical biographies, whether it's mm-hmm. David McCullough or Doris Kearns Goodwin or any, any of those authors that have written great biographies, uh, there is something to be learned from anybody that's achieved what I would call the level of achievement or success that warrants somebody writing a biography about. Mm-hmm. Yep, those are great. Some great writers that have some seriously big chops at the <laughs> at, at writing biographies and I'll make sure to put those in the show notes for people that want to explore those. Um, question about the military, military history. Uh, you obviously went to Naval Academy, uh, played baseball there, you know, have a background with, in the military. What's any specific philosophies or strategies that you've picked up along the way that you found specifically beneficial in the C-suite? Well, I think um, I, I've always found it beneficial, not only in, in all the people that I've worked with, but in what people would appreciate most about me is providing them my honest opinion. I think too often there are, are people that will provide the, the opinions of what they think the individual wants to hear. And so, you know, whether that falls under the heading of, of integrity or as I say, you know, you pay me for my opinion. Mm-hmm. And so here's my opinion. Uh, I, I think that is uh, ex- extremely critical along the way. I, I also think the other, if you think about, it, it's not rocket science in a sense in that uh, there's, to me, there's no substitute for a great attitude. You know, I, I, I would try very hard never to have a bad day. And to me, there's always a silver lining in what's going on uh, around you. And so if you think about the people you like to be around or that want to be around you, they're going to be around people that make them feel better about their interaction. They are uh, not going to be around the people that bring them down all the time. And so I think attitude is a, is a, is a huge one. And then I think doing the basics between no substitute for hard work, no substitute for kind of the, the discipline and the consistency of, Hey, I'm going to show up when I say I'm going to show up and uh, being a real partner with individuals along the way. Fantastic. Bob, I think that's a great place to wrap up. Other than LinkedIn, I'll make sure to put your LinkedIn profile uh, in the notes there and in the show notes. Any other things that that you want to talk about or that we 
that we missed today that you uh, want to share? I don't think so. I think you've covered it pretty well. Okay. Yeah. So in the show notes, you'll have the uh, link to Bob's LinkedIn profile as well as up his book. And whenever his second book's out, we'll make sure to add that on there as well. Uh, but I highly recommend up, uh, you know, we, we, we covered a couple of great stories out of there today and a couple of good strategies, but there's even more uh, that we should have time to get to that's in the book. So I really recommend those and uh, definitely giving a shout out to Bob on LinkedIn. Thanks, Bob. Appreciate you being on today. Thanks for having me, Ben. My pleasure. Ben Fanning is a number one best-selling author, Inc. Magazine columnist, and CEO of the Fanning Group, an international consultancy and corporate training company. To learn how they can help your organization, go to benfanning.com.